Welcome in Braves Today, bravestoday.com. As you see, Chris Medlin, which, by the way, the biggest flex I've, I've had as a guest thus far with the World Series saying. back there behind him. And the thing is, is he even told me beforehand, he said, this, that's not even like planned. His wife stuck him in the basement so he's not loud and keeping the kids up and everything else. <laughs> Always <laughs> so, the goal. So your wife has put you in this position. So now correct. I will have to say, I mean, I've had Glavin on. By the way, his wife was cleaning behind him the entire time that we did our podcast. Whenever I had it. <laughs> so I the, windows, was... where, where the beach, you got the beach in the background, probably. I mean, yes, yes, that's, that's a real Ex- exactly. And uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Johnny. Last time I had him on, he he said he was just glad the kids didn't go running behind him the entire time. Uh, yeah, whenever, yeah. whenever he was on, so he was just he was just happy we had a quiet setting. So uh, got you on here because uh, talk a little bit about uh, the legacy sports complex that you guys are involved in and. Uh, I guess whenever you got friends like you that have a World Series behind you, people like Johnny call and say, hey, man, I need you to invest in this thing. And uh, you're actually one of the first baseball players that's invested in it. Yeah. I mean, you have guys like Sean Witherspoon. I mean, you know, Christian Blake, Mohamed Sanu, you know, some Falcons guys who got involved and they have tons of really good talent in there, but offered tons of, you know, youth programs as well. Um, But yeah, Johnny's wife, Viv, you know, called us and was like, hey, you know, Dustin, he's looking for for people to come, good people to come on, and and that's the thing that really got to me. I mean, there's there's complexes, you know, technically all over the place, but mm-hmm. when when they're looking for like you know family men, like people of character, and and just that type of thing, um, you know, it, it it makes you feel good about investing in something that you know is going to affect kids, college kids, high school kids looking to go to the next level and getting some some quality instruction. Um, it may not always be one-on-one, but you know, the group setting stuff, I mean, myself, Johnny, we're going to sit down and kind of come up with a program for the baseball side that can really kind of get a baseline for, for kids. I mean, for me, it's, I, I keep going to the, to, to youth baseball because my son's in the middle of it. We haven't done the travel ball thing yet. He's still a, a rec kid, but you know, it's, it's, it's almost become somewhat of a, a monopoly where it's like you have to do this, otherwise you will never make it. And and I, I just don't think you should be pushing 12, 13-year-old kids who haven't, you know, finished growing yet, don't even know what they're capable of. And you're like, oh, your your baseball career is done. You didn't make our high school team, our travel ball team, or whatever it is. And, mm-hmm. and you're just giving them access to the knowledge that that I never had when I was coming up. And and I mean, I, I was pitching in the big leagues, like looking at film, not knowing what I'm looking at, like what, you know, but what I actually needed to do physically um, to, to make adjustments. So just kind of coming up with a baseline for the youth to kind of really develop into more than just throwers, understanding the mechanics of it, the science-based technology that goes on when in, in every sport, honestly. But uh, the fact that this is a, a multi-sport complex that's going to offer so many different things, whether it's MMA, wrestling, lacrosse, football, baseball. I mean, the new complex, you know, touring that, that was – you know, good enough for me to, to invest in it. But just knowing the people that you're investing with and you're going to be spending your time with, um, you know, it was a, just a, a good decision. It just makes you feel better about it just being some financial, you know, mm-hmm. decision. It became like a, a personal one, you know, what would I want my own kids to, to be involved in and, and get instruction from? And uh, I think we've got a great group of guys that uh, that's going to push that through. Somebody had asked me uh, after they saw the last pod that I was visiting with Johnny, they said, now, what is this? Where is it? And I said, man, it's like fundamentals, but like times a thousand because you're talking with guys that have been either in the NFL or like you said, in, you know, in MMA, which by the way, have you had a chance to go toe to toe with Dustin yet? Have you, you try to square up with him? Not not yet. No, I don't know if we're there yet. I don't know if we'll ever be there, Uh, but that's the, the throw yourself into the fire. I'll just start trying to tackle him and he'll flip me around easy. Um, That'd be a good, you know, good lesson, I guess, uh, throwing yourself into the fire. But um, yeah, no, like, like you said, just, it, the first, uh, what, two, two Wednesdays ago, Dustin threw me up in front of, you know, the people that work with, you know, work with us, a lot of the coaches, and I'm having to talk in front of these people that I had, I just met and, you know, public speaking is not my favorite, but I just talk, I just, I talk from the heart and, and, you know, really just, I, I want to be on the same page with the whole group and, and really push this message of, you know, everyone's welcome to come and learn, you know, how to get to the next level, whether it's, whether you're seven or whether you're mm-hmm. 18 looking to go into college or you're a pro guy who's looking to just incrementally get better. We have access to everything in, in terms of that, recovery, just things that I never paid attention to. I was more, till, till my last day in the big leagues, I was just more like, oh my God, I'm still here. I'm here. I'm here. I can't believe it. So I never lost that that kind of joy for the game until the very end. So to offer that and just be like, look, this is what it takes. I can help you. We can help you. And uh, 
in no matter what sport it is, we have we have guys in in any any facet to be able to to offer that to kids to be able to reach out and touch a pro athlete. Like I never I never felt that until I was in big league camp in spring training. You know, mm. so it's uh to be able to just be like wow, you know, it's near impossible to make it, but you're standing around people who have it's it's got to be uplifting and 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 you know you get the lessons and 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 the training that you need to really push yourself forward. Well, and the ones that are young enough, I mean they're getting to learn lessons that you had to learn, as you just said, that you didn't learn until you get in spring training. Well, to, to you got invited to the bigs. Uh, co- correct. And, and that feeling, cause I know the feeling, I know the feeling of not growing up with much, you know, the, just the, the equipment factor, just every, everything else. It's just, it was very, very basic. Um, I'm not, you know, playing this little violin cause I know people have it way worse, but I'm just talking about in terms of experience. It was, it was very much of a, a crap shoot. I mean, you have no idea other than up in here that like, I'm going to be a big leaguer and like you have this 100% goal of it. I mean, I didn't have a backup plan, which is not a great plan. Um, unless, you know, you, you just become so ingrained and focused and that mindset. And that's the mindset you want to create for a lot of these, a lot of the youth and a lot of guys that it's, it's possible, but it comes from like here and understanding the mechanics of what you're trying to do as well. But that, that mentality of like, I will not be beat. I will not be stopped. It can happen to anybody, and we just want to offer a complex, multiple complexes for people to to really feel that that goal. And and even if it's not even you trying to play pro, you know, pro, it's just you don't know what someone's home home life is like. You know, right. kids without parents. You know, just what you don't know anybody's situation. So to be to offer you know somewhere to to come and 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 get get teaching and mentorship from just really good people really good men and women that you know that that have that to offer i, I think it, it's a, it just like i said it's that really feel good feeling uh going mm-hmm. into a business investment which is you know my my first kind of kind of go around with this type of thing so thinking of yourself as a business owner is kind of a a weird concept for me but um mm-hmm. when it's something that you care so much about that you're passionate about that you actually know about i mean it, it's it's a no brainer well, and clearly there's a demand. I mean, two complexes now. Uh, the second one going to open, you said, late January, more than likely? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like soft soft launch January 8th and January 27th will be the, the grand opening. I'll be at my sister-in-law's wedding uh, for that. But, um, you know, it's the, the interest we've gotten so far without the doors even being open is, is, is pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, just a lot of the state-of-the-art stuff that we're going to be able to offer and um, really try to, you know, help each community out in, in, in terms of improving and, and just having, having somewhere to go that that'll feel like home and, and you'll have some good, be, be surrounded by a lot of really good people. What's your take on kids today and the, the specializing and, and, you know, instead of playing multiple sports, that's what I find interesting is this is a type of facility that's got, it's not just a baseball facility. It's not just an MMA facility. It's not just a football facility. It's all of this. And you mentioned recovery. There's everything from, uh, uh, even classroom work where, I mean, it's, I mean, you guys are going over the middle side of things instead of just going out there and roll a ball out and playing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I uh, think yeah. it's, it, is it getting back to that? Because at one point in time, there was that group of kids that they just played baseball or they just played golf or they only played football and they couldn't play basketball or, or baseball because they had this football camp and that football camp and that football camp. And now it seems like a lot of kids are getting back into, Hey, I want to play it all. And then we'll find something that I'm really good at later on. Well, correct. I mean, you got a lot of parents, I think, living vicariously through their kids where it's like, I didn't make it, but, you know, we're a baseball family or we're a football family, whatever it is. I mean, you, you don't know. It. And it, it really is up to the kid and, and up to the parents giving the kids the opportunity to to try multiple things and, and, and try things out. I mean, I feel like I'm not that old. I'm 38. Uh, <laughs> but I, I still grew up in a different generation where my dad paid 20 bucks. I played rec league. We did mm-hmm. park all stars. We traveled around a little bit just locally and played other parks. And like, that was our travel ball. But the way it is now, it's just, it's, it's these empires of you want to, you want to do something, you got to come through us. And if you're not good enough, you're done. It's just like the business aspect of what should be fun for kids uh, in, in all sports, whether it be like AAU basketball, mm-hmm. seven on sevens and things like that. Yeah. You want to, concentrate some of the best talent and that makes it fun and exciting and interesting but there's a lot of diamonds in the rough that are just getting kind of weeded out that aren't even giving being given an opportunity anymore um i I saw i saw some numbers the other day on the internet i don't know if they're true or not but i'm gonna go and just be like the the number baseball numbers are dropping down i mean yeah i've coached uh at milton high school 
uh, pitching coach, which, by the way, we just won state in football. Boom. Shout out to <laughs> the Eagles. Uh, they, they won at the Benz the other day. I went. It was awesome. Um, you know, kids with multiple multiple bats, like just just the, the equipment stuff and just the, the cost that it, it takes to even play for a travel ball team. It just mm. – I'm not going to say it infuriates me because I haven't experienced it yet, but just when I see kids getting weeded out that should still be given an opportunity to play or at least have a place to go where they can get a chance to improve and get a chance to try out next year and think just things like that. You, you know, I, I just, it, it definitely frustrates me that the, you have to play one sport. And that's what I told a lot of my, my high school pitchers that I was working with. They're like, Oh coach, like, they all have their own pitching guy. They all have, they all go to complexes and things like that, but we've programmed pitchers to be, not to be non-athletes, but you know, they're like, Oh, PFPs, look at the silly pitcher. Like can't field the ball, can't <laughs> swing the bat. None of those things. And what I tell my pitchers, I'm like, dude, do you want to get like throw harder? Do you want to get stronger? Go work out with the football team, go to a mm-hmm. complex. Like that's that multi-sport, you know, thing that, that I think baseball can do a better job of. Like, you know, I was told my entire career, no lifting overhead, you know, five pound weights, set your scaps, work, you know, the small muscles. But while you're working these big muscles and doing bigger lifts, you're engaging everything instead of just isolating. So baseball is getting back into like, hey, like, let's just get strong and and let these these kids be explosive. But, you know, I, I just hate the specializing of the pitching, especially where it's like there's freshmen in high school and they've been POs for three years. Yeah what you don't go play left field you don't like no like no my coach doesn't let me and i'm like what (laughs) you know because even i mean i i got i got drafted to high school as a as a shortstop i I was a position player in a college like what that did for me as a pitcher and my mentality of like reading swings and knowing like where someone might be trying to go with and and my ability to execute and throw where i want the ball to go I mean, that was astronomical and just understanding the game, knowing how to pick guys off, knowing how to get rundowns, just being athletic. I just think that intermingling of sports needs to be more of a more of a thing because when it's specialized, yes, you get these robots up there who are like, pick up leg, throw ball. Yes, it's 97, but what happens after that? I and mean, look at the big leagues now with the new rules. Nobody uh-huh. picks over anymore. You know they're stealing. You can do a pitch out, <laughs> you know? Give the catcher a chance. I mean, I, I you know, working with Bally, uh, Bally's doing the Braves pregame, postgame. I, I watched all these games and I'm like, dude, they're not even trying to throw guys out. You know, yeah. Darno, I mean, Murphy, they, they, they didn't have a ton of time and they're really good catchers. Guys just sliding in, you know, with no throw because the pitchers aren't quite paying attention. So that game, that part of the game is kind of leaving, even though, you know, guys are still in more bases. So just the, understanding the game, being an athlete, that type of thing. The intermingling of sports needs to be a thing for sure. Well, you bring that up. And I mean, I know we're, you know, we're talking about the legacy sports complex, but I mean, let's talk about this team a little bit. Let's talk about this past year with that. And what's your, as a pitcher, how would you, how would you feel about it, about the rule changes? Number one, the pitch clock is some said they like it. Some said they don't. Um, Some love to pitch in rhythm and just kind of stay, you know, it doesn't bother them. Now I do think it's probably cut down on some innings because, uh, you know, as you said, pitchers aren't athletes, so they have to labor a little bit when they're up there. I said people, <laughs> people say they're not athletes. You know what sounds athletic to me? Driving down a mound with one leg and catching all your weight with the other and firing that. and le- That sounds pretty athletic to me. Oh, how the times have changed. From a shortstop to now he's defending pitchers. It's amazing. Correct. Correct. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it clearly, I mean, it helped Acuna out. But still, there were a lot of bases he got with just no throws. But I, I still think that the talent was there because, I mean, you don't, you don't pick up that many stolen bases without, uh, but he took advantage of the rules, knowing a guy couldn't go over more than twice to him. Otherwise he, he had to go to the plate. And I'm just amazed at what you just said. I said that numerous times too, watching. I'm like, okay, the runner knows you're going to the plate. We all sitting there six beers deep know you're going to the plate yet you throw it right down the middle or you're trying to make a pitch to get a guy instead of taking the pitch out and giving your catcher a chance. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the big, the big leg kick. And, uh, but I, I think a lot of that is, you got analytics guys now. Every team has, you know, an entire crew of people who are like, "This is what we're doing. This is the game plan." And, you know, they're like, "Screw, screw the runner. That's fine. We're going for strikeouts. We're going for swings and misses." And that's, you know, that wasn't my style. I was like, you know, two seamer change up, pitch to contact, pitch quick. So you talk about the pitch clock. I mean, I don't. I was just ready to get 
me being happy to be there, obviously, I was ready to get it over with. Like, I'm, I'm ready for a couple beers. Like, I need yeah. to get, <laughs> you know, I enjoyed the moment when I was there, but I was like, whoa, let's go. You're out. You're out. You're out. Oh, base hit. Cool. You're out. Like, that was my, you're either going to get a hit or I'm going to get you out. Like, let's not delay this. I'm enjoying myself, but my goodness, let's go. So I don't, I don't think the pitch clock would totally affect me and my mentality, but me as a fan, I do enjoy a 45, 30 minute, you know, shorter games. Um, no, they I, are I definitely do. more enjoyable, more enjoyable to 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 watch. And in my idea, because it's it suits my pitching uh, personality um, better, I guess. But if you're if guys are complaining about the pitch clock, you need to speak up. <laughs> you're one of the you're one of the slow ones. So come on, you yeah. know. Well, and I said that I, I said you know this could have been implemented back during the the glory days that I grew up watching and, and watching the Glavins and the Maddoxes of the world. They literally. Got the ball still in the They were ready. They were always waiting on the hitter. And so I called it a hitter's clock more than a pitcher's clock, in my opinion, because a lot of effective pitchers like yourself, especially contact pitchers or corner pitchers and that kind of thing that didn't throw stuff just 98 right down the middle of the plate. Um, you guys seem like y'all were just kind of in a rhythm the entire time. Like you guys wanted to just give me the ball, catcher, sit down, shut up, give me a sign, and let's go. I mean, well, as, I mean as Maddox famously said, I'm going to tell you what I'm bringing you. I'm going to sit up there. I'm going to throw it 85 to 89 miles an hour. It's going to be a sinker, and you're not going to touch it. Uh, I mean, 100%. But if you're talking as an as an athlete, I mean, quarterbacks, they go they go no huddle. All of a sudden, they're like completion, 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 completion. It, it's the same thing. If you're trying to repeat yourself, repeat your delivery, repeat your swing, mm -hmm. Do you want to throw a ball and wait 45 seconds to a minute to throw your next one? Like, probably not. Mm -hmm. If you go and dot a pitch down and away, like, I want to get back up there and do that again or pitch off of that or whatever. So to, for me and, and any athlete, I feel like you would you get one down, boom, let's go to the next one. Awesome. So that's that rhythm you get. And you're taught as a base runner, like, you know, mess with the pitcher's rhythm, hitters, call time. Like, why? Why, why are you doing that? Because it messes with yeah. your rhythm. So – when you're in that zone, like like Maddox and Smoltz and Gladden and all those, you know, the, the Hall of Famers, yeah. And if I had their stuff, I would want the ball in my hand. Like, let's go. That was so nasty. Let's do it again. Um, but, you know, just for the most part, it's just as an athlete, you want to be ready to go. And like, hey, that swing felt good. I want to – I know what he's coming with next. Like, I, I'm, I'm locked in. And mm. it, it adds to that, that you know, the, you being locked in. It's just you being like, boom, let's go. Let's go. Rep, rep, rep. And you're, if you're physically prepared for it, you can you can run off some pretty cool, uh, you know, strings of success. How would you handle this lineup? The Acunas of the world, the Olsons of the world, the Rileys of the world. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, I, I'll ask you in a little bit about L.A. and what they've done as far as what's going to be on the mound. Not necessarily mm -hmm. in 24, but what, be, what will be on the mound in 25 when Otani comes back. But let's put you in the shoes of being an opposing pitcher and facing Acuna to lead off the game. I mean, it, this guy yeah, just seems to had the talent that just won the home run derby down in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, uh, his batting, his batting average, by the way, I don't know if you've even looked at the numbers. I haven't. I got, I got too many, I got too many kids running around. Here he's batting over 400. He's batting 444 wow. right now. Yeah, not, not <laughs> not, surprising. And the thing is, is everybody goes, yeah, but it's down in Venezuela. I said, okay, it's not the stuff that he's going to see in major league baseball, but let's not discount the fact that those guys are throwing 97 miles an hour down there. They just haven't made it to the big leagues yet. Correct. There, there's a large majority of pitchers pitching in pro ball, whether the, the Mexican league, Puerto Rico, like Venezuela, it, the, the Dominican, it doesn't matter. All these guys, something has clicked in terms of technology and what we know creates velocity. And, you know, there, there's freak, freak athletes that can throw 97. So he's not just bashing around nobodies. Um, right. There's some, some serious stuff that he's facing, but in terms of, you know, doing it at the major league level, the world's best, you know, congregating into, into a league, I mean, it was it was crazy to see, and then working two series in a row, a, a whole homestand, you know, pregame, postgame, it became hard to talk about. You would think like, oh, all you do is just talk good about Acuna all the time. That's so easy to do, and it's like, no, it becomes like he was doing things that nobody had ever done before. So a lot of like, oh, I, I don't even know what to say anymore because it's just like there's an, another thing that he's doing where it's like, well. There's no way he can do better. And it's like, boom, next day he's, he's up there. So just otherworldly, you know, unanimous MVP. It just, there was, there was no doubt that the talent was there, but for him to apply it, especially myself going through a couple Tommy Johns, mm. knowing what that's like, you know, the ACL as a, as an outfielder, as a fast guy, as a leadoff guy, for him to bounce back doing that, you know, have the, what many would consider a down year, a bad mm. year, which <laughs> still hit 
some homers and stuff. But uh, to bounce back after that and just be healthy, you could see the swing differences when he really broke down film and, and the way he was using his lower half, the way he, more balanced, less upper body. I mean, it, it was just an extraordinary year and rightfully so the, the MVP of the, of the league. The MVP of the team to me, if you take away Acuna, was Olsen to me. And the reason I say that is because let me just be up front. I was pissed when Freddie left. I was a huge Freddie fan. Uh, I, mean, I was, one, I was one, one of my good friends. Exactly. Man. I was one of those fans that, uh, I mean, I know, you know, I'm in media and that kind of thing, but still you can be a, you can be a fan. And I mean, my wife had the Freddie t-shirt and she doesn't even watch baseball. And she had the, the, <laughs> the shirt with us and she wore it to one of the games this past year. And I was like, you can't wear that. And she's like, I am wearing it. I, I'm, you know, the Dodgers aren't playing here. It was, I think it was the Nationals that were in town. So uh, mm-hmm. when, when we went to the game and I said, I don't want you to wear it. She goes, no, I want, it's my favorite shirt. I'm wearing it. I, I like it. Blah, blah, blah. So, but Alex Anthopoulos did a pretty good job of getting his replacement. And Olsen, who led the league in home runs, I mean, I didn't see that coming. Well, home runs and RBIs. But when you have yeah. guys like Acuna, like Ozzy, like, I mean, guys were on base all the time for him. Yeah. Um, it's it's one thing to have guys on, but to be able to drive it in. I mean, he, he dropped his strikeout rate. I mean, he still struck out a ton, but less yeah, than but something the year before. So his barrel percentage, yeah. his hard hit rate was just, I mean, it's through the roof. And when you got a swing like his, it's one of the prettiest swings in the league if you – want to compare it to other guys. I mean, when he makes contact, it's those majestic homers over the the chop house. I mean, it's it's nothing it's nothing like any any other any other swing in the big leagues, but just to have that kind of production out of him with Freddie leaving, obviously there's those questions of, mm-hmm. you know, what are they going to do and for it to instantly happen and I think that helped kind of move things along because there was that emotional attachment as well to to yeah. Freddie and you saw him come back and Obviously, he he cares about the organization as well, yeah. um, and the shock of him leaving. I mean, I think it was a two way road where it was equally as uh, shocking both ways. But um, that kind of closure of him coming in and talking to the fans, which I I don't know if I would have done yeah. uh, if I'm Dodger PR, uh, but <laughs> Dodger marketing. I mean, it was cool for Braves fans, but man, if you're a Dodger fan, you're like, dude, what's going? On? You're on our team now. Um, I never. Yeah, that's the, that's, like that's that. the, I'm just, that's the Southern hospitality thing. Exactly. You know, the Dodger fans didn't. I mean, Freddie, I mean, you saw the the clips of Freddie, you know, uh, trick-or-treating with his kids in Atlanta yeah. and uh, people shooting video of it. And, of course, the famous scene of Chipper and him riding on the back of the yeah. four-wheeler with one another. And so it, it almost felt like family as a fan. And so uh, – and, and that's the thing is I tell everybody all the time, I said, I don't think people were pissed at Freddie. I think everybody was kind of upset at the front office thinking, well, why didn't you give him six years? Yeah. You know, why did the Dodgers give him six and you didn't give him six? You just offered five. And so Correct. um that is – that's what we got feedback-wise anyway on on yeah. what we were doing. So – That's that that's that emotional attachment. I mean, it had – Freddie had Chipper Jones vibes, you know, like mm-hmm. 20 years with one organization in a, in a, in a, a game that – you know, some of the best players are playing for six or seven different teams. Mm. Um, so that rare play with one organization, you know, Joey Votto, like that type of organizational changing talent slash players, like Freddie was that guy. And, uh, you know, Jay Hay got more of the, more of the, the hype, more of the media attention. Mm-hmm. Freddie, it's uh, somehow a second rounder. I don't know how, he, you know, even at the high school level, you could tell that that dude is contact and he's six, five. I mean, he was gonna. He was gonna be something special, but the, the defense, just the all around. I mean, one of the best people I've been around, but just I mean, obviously one of the game's best. And for him to go into L.A., which is a tough place to play, as a as a, it's not quite playing for the Yankees or Boston, where guys are, you know, beating you down if you if you struggle. But Freddie literally never struggles. He's always gonna put the ball in the bat. It's so impressive to see, and then to be surrounded by Mookie and just uh, Max Muncy, just the, the the talent that just keeps going over there, and you t- you mentioned it. Both you know, earlier, yeah. the, the new talent that's there. It's just, it's uh, going to be pretty, uh, pretty crazy to see what's going on in LA this year. We'll continue our conversation with Chris Medlin. It's all brought to you by Active Wealth Management. Be sure to call, call forward today. Also, you can visit annuity360.net for your free book. More with Medlin and we'll be joined by Johnny Venters as well. That's on the next episode.